his center, as you'll see here. Jimmy Ritty. America in the 1950s. The Elva story where Muhammad Ali grew up and who would witness Kennedy's death. But Connors and McEnroe lived in two Americas. The heart of the United States, East St. Louis, Illinois, for Jimmy in 1952. Connor's father controls the bridge toll booth that spans the Mississippi. New York and Queens for John, who arrives seven years later. McEnroe's father is a great business lawyer, close to Central Park. Connors, he really is a guy from deep America, who is from a modest background, and who is very rude, in general and in particular. His family was a good one, not poor, it would be wrong to describe it like that but it was not a cultured family, and rather much more passionate about baseball games, than by the future of the world. Connors is the most American of Americans. At the time, Americans knew little about the rest of the world because, before having issues with Vietnam, it was still the world's dominant country, and I think Connors didn't care what others out of America thought of him. McEnroe, it's more complex, he's a real New Yorker, with the dirty kid side from New York, a very strong New York accent. You speak French or any language? Sit down! Sit down! Understand? Sit down! But at the end of the day, he is from a good family. He lets himself go because he is ill-mannered. They call him the dirty kid, but he's more classy in the way he carries himself. He went to Stanford University. Plus, I think he was always fascinated by the arts and the artistic community. So he's someone who was much more open to the world than Jimmy Connors could be. Behind this contest of champions are strong women. Two moms. Kate McEnroe, the discreet but ultra-demanding nurse, she thought her son would be a dentist and rather not a top athlete. It was, it was mum who pushed him. Kay McEnroe was never satisfied with John's school tests, you know, if he came second, why aren't you first? You know, uh, so she instilled the hard-driving competitiveness in him exactly as Jimmy Connors' mothers did. Except that for the Connors, it's not one but two women who will encourage their champion every step of the way. The little words of encouragement in the socks from his grandmother. Jimbo screams at the edge of the court by Gloria, the mom, tennis teacher. His mother always described tennis to him as a boxing match. There are a lot of similarities between both. Tennis is mental boxing. The punches are physical, they are felt in the mind. She did everything so her son becomes a champion. By teaching him the game early, she saw that he was gifted. And then they instilled in him the spirit of combat. The first match is set in Wimbledon. Jimmy Connors Garden. At 25, Jimbo is the boss of courts. It's been six years of strong emotions in tennis world. In 1977, John McEnroe was only in high school when he stood in front of him for the semifinal, barely 18 years old, completely unknown. And in the changing room, Connors welcomed him. He didn't talk to John. He ignored John. Jimmy ignored John in the locker room. The first time I laid eyes on McEnroe, it was in the men's dressing room at Wimbledon. A few minutes before entering the central court. He looked like the Pillsbury Doughboys with a headband. I asked myself, how the hell was he able to qualify? It was clear, I was not going to give him an inch. And on the contrary I could rattle him. John had never met him before, 
and Jimmy didn't speak with him. John was intimidated by that. He's trying to impose himself indirectly by being arrogant. He came up to me to introduce himself. I grabbed my bag, my rackets, and walked past him. No smile, no hello, no handshake, no acknowledgement of existence. Oh, he didn't like it. I don't know if I go so far as to say upset. John went out and still won a set, so that's not so bad. Yes, he wouldn't have got a big hug. No, Connors would not have given him the time of day. Connors would have seen him as a threat. Connors won the first match on English turf. But the two players take a rendezvous, and the tennis world understands that with these two, they are not going to be bored. Both players are tenacious bulldogs who come from a different environment, who want to win, give their all, and entertain at the same time. And they really, truly did it, but they got differently. Connors is really mad right now. Between rants and blows of genius, it's the start of 14 years battle, which will change the American tennis. My brother was a sort of a tortured genius at times on the court. Uh, he brought so much passion to tennis, so much flair. He was MC the magician, a tennis genius. We didn't understand how he played. It felt like when he went for the back flip that he was drawing the ball to him. The players had a lot of trouble guessing what he was going to do. He didn't look like a very good athlete, but he's just unbelievably quick. He could get everywhere before he even hit the ball. He was, he's, wow. On the one hand, McEnroe, technician, intelligence, like a Muhammad Ali at the time. And then on the other side, Connors, it was no longer the Tyson who looked for trouble to want to knock systematically on anything that moved. Jimmy Connors is a street fighter, but it was sort of the first player of his generation uh, that really brought that mentality to the tennis court. He liked the chaos. Connors was um, the ultimate competitor. He never let you breathe on a tennis court. He was at you all the time. So imagine this Connors there, barging in with his dirty manners in the country clubs of the early 70s. Like a dog in a bowling game for these very selective clubs where high society dressed all in white reigned supreme in tennis. Here, especially in Forest Hill. The Posh Club of New York welcomed at the time the U.S. Open. It was quiet. You clapped or you whistled if you didn't agree with the call. Jimmy Connors made some pretty suggestive gestures. A bit naughty on the court at times, and we all went, oh, you know. It was a shocker. It was shocking to the to the crowd. Shocking the country club world, the bourgeois, I think. It must have been a Connors' great achievements. Connors had a tendency, difficult to curb, to touch his virile organs at any time, whether to show how fortunate he was that the other was lucky. It was non-stop. All his movements were bordering on obscenity. Did I love watching Jimmy throw his racket? Yeah, I guess I did. <laughs> Everyone has their own way of rebelling. Everyone has their pet peeve. For one, it's the establishment. For the other, those damn bullet trajectories. He wanted to play the perfect tennis match. He wanted to win six love, six love, six love, lose no points. That's what he went on court trying to achieve. And he wasn't very happy if he didn't achieve it. Um, he, he was a, a perfectionist. And when the bump starts rubbing with perfectionists, he seeks to crush him, while the other aimed at the top of his game. Yes, it's a mistake, Mr. McEnroe. Inevitably, it explodes. How can you be sure from here? How can you be sure from here? Ah. 
Listen. I'm tired of you behaving like a kid. You behave like my five-year-old son. Now we have to play. Shut up now. It's not going well. And his lady claps. McEnroe and Connors hated each other. There really was a cultural world. When they were playing, it was war. It was sparking. We felt some kind of hate. Mac and Jimbo hated each other wherever they meet each other. Their favorite playground is New York, Flushing Meadows, in nighttime duels that totally blew up. The most epic of all, the 1980 semifinal. The father and the little brother are on the McEnroe side. Connors did a great job to get to the ball. 12-15 when they got off the court. Terribly long match. It was very, very hard fought. Well, I remember the intensity of the match because in those days at the stadium court at the U.S. Open, the player box was literally like right on the court. Connors would kind of talk back and forth to his box maybe to our box as well and say certain things under his breath. And, you know, that was sort of the way he was. John was more kind of focused on just what was going on. The battle favored John, who won the first set. But the Mac machine loses the rhythm. Connors loses 11 games in a row. Mac goes crazy. Let me know when you see a good ball. What do you want, mister? I don't know. Mr. Incompetent. At some point in that match, on a debreak ball, McEnroe loses it, explodes, throws away his racket. The racket goes to the other side of the court, around counters. Out and Swan at the mark. Jimmy picked it up. I thought something might happen when he kind of faked like he was going to throw it, throw it back, and then he walked over and handed it to John as he was walking to his chair. At that point in the match, Connors was exasperated by McEnroe because he took him for an untenable kid. Knowing Connors, he would have said, Here, take your toy. Meantime, games are one all. Games are one all. Connors had to be anxious. He devait saliver. There must have been great excitement. Sublime. For Connors to have thrown his racket at McEnroe that way. For driving McEnroe crazy. I think these are moments. Today McEnroe must be. Ça doit être encore, il doit se sentir. Feeling humiliated over to what happened then. Cet instant, McEnroe. Pleasure is short-lived for Jimmy Connors, who will end up losing in the tiebreak in the fifth inning. That's it. That's it. The handshake is the reflection of their relationship, Frosty. It's really that long, tough Connors McEnroe rivalry, who plays tennis in the United States, a popular sport. It's at that moment it happened. Before, it was always major American sports, baseball, soccer, and basketball that dominated. But what happens on the court, when Connors and McEnroe play, makes it a gladiator sport, a sport not too intense. A sport that people can watch like they watch a soccer game with friends and a beer, while screaming. It's the time when a lot of kids would start playing tennis. And also the moment when many sponsors will enter the arena, with advertising contracts like we've never seen before. Connors McEnroe period was the biggest moment for tennis in the United States. It is not the same today. That euphoria, that delirious public, pushed tournament organizers to leave clubs where they are now cramped. At the end of the 70s, a huge stadium was built in New York, Flushing Meadows, 18,000 seats. 
tennis took a new turn. Certain people come out to be entertained and certain players, Jimmy knows that they want to be entertained. Everybody knows that McEnroe is going to say, you can't be serious. It's his catchword. And if he doesn't, they go home disappointed, <laughs> sort of. And Jimmy carries on the same way. And people come out to see that. They are coming out to see a show. But they almost feel entitled to a show or a performance as opposed to just a match. And of course, the TV also takes over the show. In the wake of the construction of the stadium, the first sports channel was created in 1979. ESPN broadcasted all the games without waiting for the finals. Now a Connors McEnroe can also be enjoyed on the sofa. Tennis organizers understood immediately that television will make them popular, while sports resisted when the TV arrived, soccer didn't want to be broadcast because of the few spectators in the stadiums. All of a sudden, players' tennis players became idols, you had them close up in your dining room, in your living room for hours. There were more close-ups of McEnroe, Connors at that time than any actor. So these people are familiar to you, and as, they expressed extremely strong feelings, of anger, rage, pain, things like that, they become idols, but mechanically. Idols to whom money flew. Jerseys, shorts, shoes. Lots of whole equipment started flirting with champions. Connors cashed in the dollars from anyone, got angry with a brand, signed with someone else. True to one thing, his metal racket, his Wilson T-2000. Even when it is no longer manufactured, a real dinosaur, impossible to string. One day Connors gave me some rackets to do. I do the ropes and break as many as I can. Sometimes my hands hurt because when the rope cuts, you're at 25, 26 kilos. However, there is a lot of effort. I would tell him, Jim, I'm not done because it breaks all the time. When will you change your racket? In his own words, he said to me, change your hand, F asterisk, 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 asterisk. At the moment, he called me, then, and he's right, the racket is his hand. Connors has, for most of his career, played with the same racket, and he thinks and I think that it's true, in fact, Connors never really got paid to play with this racket. Because Wilson probably knew that he wasn't able to play with a racket other than with this racket that suited him perfectly. He was someone who, in terms of contracts, was probably less spectacular as McEnroe. And it just was the beginning too. These are the first big contracts. It was McEnroe, Borg, great at the time. At the end of the 1970s, McEnroe was at the head of one of the most resounding sports marketing success. John, the naughty boy, wrote the Nike story. For the first time, a tennis star sold his rebellious image to a shoe dealer and its founder, Phil Knight. They saw him playing, and Phil Knight, who was the president or the chief executive at Nike then, saw John playing in a tournament in Dallas, a junior tournament. And he said to his people, I want to sign him, sign him up. So we, we did did, and he's been with Nike ever since. McEnroe was the perfect prototype for him because he could use him. It did not leave people indifferent. He was ranting, breaking rackets. It all comes with a price and it's all great. Phil Knight came back from that trip and he said, I really want him. He's 18, but I'm sure he has potential. I'm sure he's going to be strong. So I'm going to do my career around him. There's nothing like a good scandal. Sports marketing was born and Nike benefited from it. Nike would get letters from people complaining about him and he, Phil Knight would write them back and say, we love him, he's our man, we like what he's doing, don't worry about it. It was very important for them to have the best player in the world or the, almost the best player in the world. They got 
publicity, you know, that he had write a, an article talking about John and arguing with the umpire and then say, by the way, John McEnroe won 616364. And that would be it. He started wearing his first pairs in 78, and he's still under contract with Nike after 37 years. It's an amazing story. Today, this shoe has been for 37 years on the market because it's from McEnroe. These are the biggest marketing successes of sports marketing in tennis. There is no such success elsewhere today. The Air Jordan in basketball, yes. But the Stan Smith and the Supreme Short, it's amazing. McEnroe, Nike emblem, Connors who moved from one sponsor to another, not to mention the official matches and some exhibition tournaments where they share up to $1 million. Between Mac and Jimbo, the rivalry is also financial. These guys are making a lot of money. I mean, a lot of money. And that Jimmy came from probably a less fortunate fa family. Um, and I think that was very important for him to be financially secure and, and make, make money. That was, that was the era. Being successful as an American, being millionaire and millionaires and private planes and limos and, and all that sort of stuff, dry, sex, drugs and rock and roll. I mean, it was, uh, it was, I think that can also drive you insane, that sort of stuff too. I mean, that obsession about money and who's, who's better than who. And, you know, before that, of course, you had, you know, John Newcomb, who was the big, the big guy and he was commanding a lot of money. And he's a guy with a moustache and had an image, handsome Australian. And, uh, you know, Jimmy wanted to do his best to, to, de to defeat him as well. So fight on the court, fight off the court. In 1980, John McEnroe was number one in the world, but he's also a big star. Far beyond tennis courts. His guitar teachers were Eric Clapton, Eddie Van Halen, Aerosmith, Santana in 1982. The biggest names in rock came around him. Just five years after the first meeting and that humiliation in the dressing rooms at Wimbledon, John, the student, caught up with Jimbo the master. Far from the ridiculous puppet Connors imagined, Champion by day, rocker by night, and no one has anything to complain about. The Connors, McEnroe, Borg Generation. In a tournament like Monte Carlo, we could find them in a nightclub between two matches. Today, you can't think of finding Federer, Nadal or Djokovic in a nightclub during Roland Garros. It is not possible. They are forbidden to do it not for the sake of morals, but because physically, sport has become much harder and the opponent stronger. I think the sport itself initiated the progress of professional sport, has more and more professional behavior. And we entered the era of totally professional sports. For the time being, the fever accompanies nights as well as days. On the court, Mac the Rocker is constantly contesting. McEnroe becomes an umpire's nightmare. There's no mark where he just did it. That was right on the line. No, but he didn't. No, but he didn't say he. There was no mark. There was no mark where he did it. No, but Jacques, he didn't. There's no mark there. McEnroe hardly trusted officials, be an umpire and a line judge. I say that without any severity, but you know, I have always told my umpires, and I had a few thousand under my supervision, if I may say so. If the first quarter of an hour went well, everything was going to be fine. What's your first quarter of an hour? In 1981, McEnroe's quarterfinal at Roland Garros is for Jacques Dorfman and his team of umpires, one of the most memories highlights of their career. 
From the start, he puts them under pressure. No, I want you to ask him again how long we're supposed to play in wet, rainy conditions. Okay? Right. And I'd like, to you, I'd like you to give me an answer when I come back. All right? Ask him now. Oui? Monsieur McEnroe demande combien de temps il est supposé jouer sous, ce, euh, sous cette euh, pluie qui euh, pleuvine et il voudrait une réponse immédiate. It was 5.30 p.m. The weather was poor and John thought that the atmospheric conditions and the condition of the court, in particular, were a disadvantage. So he didn't want to play, despite everything because of the public, which would have set the court ablaze if we hadn't scheduled this match. He played. On several occasions, John asked me to go down to the court to check its condition, saying the court can't be used, the ground is slippery, I'm going to fall. It doesn't matter if it rains, you know, the court's already wet, Mr. Dorfman, it's wet already. And of course, his words were followed by gestures. Accompanied by gestures. And people said to me, he must have said terrible things to you, very serious things. Maybe he even insulted you. What's not possible when we break our leg? When I break my leg, I'll let you know, all right? To say that's very kind, that would be excessive. But there were times when he said much worse things. During all these years, the anger of the little genius intrigues the tennis world. I don't see it. I mean, I never saw that he had an authority issue when we were kids. I mean, he was the oldest in the family. He was did great in school, was very smart. I remember sitting at the table with, you know, my dad basically saying, you know, John, you got to control yourself. I say, stop it. You're too good for that. Let it go. Forget about it. He didn't pay much attention. Dad, I just, I just can't, I can't control myself. I get so amped up out there when he's in the middle of this, you know, intense environment. You know, he said, get up, and he put his arm around me, and he said, Dad, it'll never happen again. He'd go on the court the next day, and in the first three points, he'd be screaming at the umpire. It was very frustrating for me, but it was, that was his way. And, and he hated losing, so that was part of it, too. You have to go back to his school days and his sense of honor. And his headmaster at Trinity in New York told me, we never had any problem with John because there weren't any officials. There were no umpires, no linesmen. And he erred on the side of giving the doubt to his opponent. If there was a close call, he gave it to the opponent. And that translated into suddenly having a man sitting up in a chair, deciding whether something was in or out, somebody who wasn't playing, who didn't have as good an eye as John did, just offended him. Why are you telling me? Are you suggesting I'm trying to take something that I don't deserve? That was his thought process. And so that infuriated him because it was testing his honor. Well, you know, I'm, I'm an honest person. I saw that in, so therefore I think it's in. If I think it's out, I'll tell you. This temperament in McEnroe is going to prove the basis of a daunting strategy. Knocking Jimbo out of his position of world number one is not enough. He also covets his rebel status. Bad Boy's place is in the heart of rivalry, and every opportunity is a good shot. McEnroe never put up with the disturbances and to him, the people who walk around the court like photographers, cameramen, sound engineers, all these people, are disturbances and prevent him from playing. When he didn't succeed to go after an umpire, he's going after a microphone, a photographer. Especially when taking photos while he throws, he can't bear it. 
It makes noise when you take the photos. He went to see all photographers. And they became his enemies. Moreover, more than once, he banged the cameras. Or by pretending, everyone got scared. Or in the microphone, so we won't hear on television what he could say. He was lashing out on everyone, to the crowd, and then it was sometimes up to the umpire. But he realized that this way of doing things could trouble the opponent. So it was always during critical times that he was doing his circus. Connors will explain to the umpire that he should not help the lying judge to find the trail of a ball. Connors, on the other hand, adapts. Deprived of his scabby role, he changes technique and uses more of this comic power. The public loves it, the adversary hates it. Every time you miss, hit a lucky shot, he was going, oh, come on, he's saying, what? hit the ball on the strings. I, mean, I didn't hear any of these things. He said, hit the ball on the strings, come on. He was laughing and pretending the kid can't play. Look, he can't hit the rack, ball on the strings. And he was just swearing at the alliance person when they had a bad call, and he was doing this. I said, no, I didn't hear, see any of that. He said, oh, yeah, he was, he was really trying to upset you. But I think that the difference was that between Jimmy and, and John and myself, Jimmy and I, we are more friendly and we did it with a smile on the face. I think John was really mean and he was upset and people saw him like he wants to kill the umpire or want to kill the opponent. But we did it with a with laugh and joking and that was the difference, I think. Little touch of the ball. Cheval. <laughs> he copied McEnroe. Connors was someone who went far beyond the limit of what we would admit today. He was trying to influence the judges, the opponent. He had quite a psychological game against his opponent to put him in a challenge. He didn't care. When he led, he had the tendency to tease non-stop. I don't think he never gave up a point. I don't remember, but he wasn't the type to erase a trace, and to say that was good, it was the umpire's job. Was he cheating? Not necessarily, but he still was, at the limit of what one could give himself at that time, much more than today. McEnroe is mad, he did hide the trace, he says. Borderline manipulation. At this game, Connors and McEnroe are both experts. John spends so much time challenging that the adversary sometimes begs the umpire to let it go. The ball is good. What am I doing? He falls to his knees. I swear it's good. I know he took over five minutes between points when I played him at Wimbledon one year. In a tiebreaker, when you change ends, it's supposed to be automatic. It took him five minutes, and the umpire said nothing because they were scared of John McEnroe saying anything because he'd yell at them. I mean, how do you take five minutes between a point? It's not a change of ends. It's not going to the toilet. It's between a point. And that upset me. Yes, of course it upset me because I was leading in the tiebreaker, and he ended up winning the tiebreaker, and I got really angry. And there's, there's some things I will never for, really forget but it's, it's, I think it's very unfair, it's just complete cheating, but he's allowed to cheat by, by the umpires. I mean, call it what you like, it's cheating. And, um, but it's, uh, it's somehow, that was one of his amazing strengths. In the back of the courtyard or even on the chair, a lot of judges are still amateurs at the time. Local guys who get trained on the job. Strong-minded persons really have nothing to fear. There's nothing we could do. I mean, uh, the point penalty systems didn't exist. So the player carried on and yelled at obscenities, they'd stick his racket between his legs and he'd use his middle finger and uh, carry on and curse under his breath. And then being on the court with him, we heard it, okay? 
But basically, the umpires were out there, we were out there to do a job and not to basically babysit a reprimand, okay? The ordeal of umpires will eventually stop, thanks to an old friend of Connor's. Illy Nastas will take it to another level, that the code of conduct will be completely reviewed. That evening, it was precisely John McEnroe who stands on the Remain Road in New York, and everything goes wrong. Even today, I don't believe what happened, you know, because we, I was already 33, and I think John was young, and I have a coach called Roy Emerson, and he told me how to upset McEnroe and all this. So, but I, I didn't have a chance to, to beat him on the court, probably, because he was bet, better than me already. So I started to stall a little bit, of, uh, sit more in the, you know, take more time to, between points, sleeping. I think I, I slept on the court, probably. McEnroe sends arms of honor to the public. Nastas, on the other hand, asks to get the control tower to divert planes passing over the court. The umpire snaps, disqualifies Nastas, and declares McEnroe winner. So the crowd started to... I saw a lot of cans of Coca-Cola and police everywhere. And the referee came in and said, OK, you have to... He put me in to play again. This was the most crazy game in my life. The press is crying out for changes. In a keep, Dennis Laland condemns one night on August 4th. A great evening abolishing the nobility that tennis had been walking for over a century. We are no longer in a Grand Slam tournament, but among the underdeveloped tennis players, among the crazy people. It is a scandal. We was considered that it was the end of time, and if we went on like this, nobody would ever put up with it anymore to watch a tennis game. Dirty kids around the corner. The outcry is such that the rules of tennis will be reviewed. No more talking to the umpire. It will take years, but it won't come however the New Yorker, who, in 10 years, will succeed the feat of being the very first player to get knocked out of a Grand Slam tournament. Lucky for him, the dirty boy is also a good American, who, even in Paris, does not fail to honor a symbol like the space shuttle. He understands well that the French spectator is also interested in this. So Mac also plays the Davis Cup, national team tournament, and major differences between the two. Jimbo runs away from it, he wins it. Five times, 12 years under the American jersey. 41 singles victories and the love of the flag from the cradle. It was important to me, as John or Patrick once said, that I used to put them to bed at night singing the national anthem. Americans do appreciate McEnroe, they defend the country, the flag. They're not just defending McEnroe. Connors couldn't handle it. Connors didn't understand the team concept, didn't understand about thinking about anyone else. Um, it was too, that was too much for him. So he was a disaster as a teammate on a Davis Cup team. The time we put both on the team, it was even worse than any other. It's a Davis Cup final in Sweden. It's a horror for the United States, a disgrace for American tennis, because they were beaten by the Swedish 3-0. In addition, they behaved like little players. Jimmy got into the big yeah. hassle. He shook the chair where the umpire was sitting. He apologized. The, the next morning, and they said, because Jimmy apologized, we won't disqualify him. We let him play. Arthur Ashe was the captain. Arthur was trying to tell John, you know, in a Davis Cup match to, to calm down. He just said, shut up and sit there. Don't say a word to me. 
or something along those lines. Just shut up, sit there, and don't open your fucking mouth. And that was to Arthur Ashe, who's one of the great humanitarians. And uh, Arthur didn't say anything, and John won. So, <laughs> so you know, you learn that he learns that day. Just let McEnroe do his do his own thing. The fight of big mouths, totally unrestrained, fascinates and divides the American public of the 1980s. Jimbo or John, the boxer or the esthete, the clown or the angry one, the Illinois guy or the New Yorker. Even those who don't like tennis have their preferences. In the great years of their rivalry, people split into two camps. It's really very obvious. It's true that New Yorkers, I can tell you, are 100% McEnroe. There, it's their boy. He is theirs, he looks like them. In deeper America, it is obviously shared depending on the region, depending on feelings. What is called the white working class are more on Connor's side. In the end, this boy without polishing but so effective, they really like it. McEnroe at times may have put Americans to shame by his carried away behavior, unchecked, uncontrolled. Connors must have been shocked at the start, the establishment, but after Connors, embodied, the American fighting spirit, the conquest, the desire to win these things. In addition, by marrying a playmate at a certain time, he achieved the ideal of a number of basic Americans. Patty Connors, Americans adopted him, same as they already loved the romance with Chris Evert. In the mid-1980s, McEnroe marries Hollywood, Tatum O'Neill, the Oscar-winning actress, even going as far as to inspire Andy Warhol. Women, artists, politicians, too, complete the picture. And this is mainly the terrain of John McEnroe's game. Both embody things that are beyond them, that are not necessarily their deep personal options. Connors with his side, I am deep America, I am like that. You have to take me like that. It's more like some sort of Republican arrogance. And it's true that McEnroe, New Yorker, cultured. Even with his ghetto language, he is closer in sensitivity to Democrats of that time. More reactionary people will tend to identify more with Connors and people feeling more progressive. More glamorous in a way, chose McEnroe more. This America divided by their choice seemed to have finally set in favor of Jimmy Connors. Even in Flushing Meadows. Stronger, more generous with the public. John was brilliant, but Jim was handsome. Connors epitomized the New York little battling spirit against the odds and against authority better than McEnroe did. Um, it was just their personalities and how it played out. It, it, was, it, it, it was very strange, but uh, Connors definitely got the New York vibe and the New York crowd on his side. Just, it just made, uh, made him dislike Connors all the more, that's all. <laughs> John was jealous of Jimmy as they got older because Jimmy learned how to work the crowd more. And I think John, what I admired, was pissed at Jimmy that he did that better than he did to get the people on his side. So maybe the tennis aficionados that understood tennis saw that John was doing things that not many other players had done. You know, I have people come up to me all the time that say, oh, I loved watching your brother, uh, but I, you know, I was a Connors fan. Having given to the public is undoubtedly Jimmy Connors' greatest pride. In his last duels with McEnroe, he enjoys, especially when he wins, like here in Toulouse, at 37 years old. It's been my fun and my pleasure to, to play him. He's a great champion and, and one that will be around for a long time, and hopefully my friend also. Congratulate Mr. Connors. I thought that he was uh, supposed to be an old man. <laughs> no. I think I'd come back next year if Jimmy doesn't come back.
but Jimmy will keep coming back. Galvanized by this rivalry with his best enemy. 20 years of an unnaturally long career. Connors on all counts. Victory and humor. Until this last great performance from 1991 at the age of 39, a semi-final at the US Open and Roland Garros, this third daunting round against Michael Chong sent him to the fifth set before letting go. At 7.25 p.m., no one was happy anymore. Jimmy Connors announces his forfeiture to the umpire. I can't anymore. I have to stop. Are you sure? Yes, you can even take my racket and go play for me. I can't play anymore. It is over. I call that elegance. That supreme elegance by Jimmy Connors against Michael Chang during the fifth set, winning the first point of the fifth set. And for me, it's a very great value, that point he won, he can say that he left the tournament that year, leading against Michael Chang and by trying to get the first point of the fifth set and just giving up then. It touched me deeply and I think the public too. It is a memory that he will keep of Jimmy Connors. The former demon became a hero. A greeting to the public, a standing ovation. But in the hallway, the camera's pictures his true pain. The one he was hiding. Jimmy and John both retired the following year, in 1992, but not totally. At the senior tournaments, they still have the good taste of hating each other. True to themselves, on the court, but also outside. There is a fairly clear symbol. McEnroe opened a modern art gallery. While Connors partnered with people who were investing in floating casinos. I think that right now, there is a big difference. Is there a problem, officer? You've parked outside the space. It's on the line. I'm sorry, sir, it's out. It's in! How can you possibly call back? I mean, it's clearly in. It's out. It's in! It's out. It's in! It's out. You cannot be serious! This is some bullshit. Also makes him unavoidable as a TV consultant. Much more than Connors, who focuses on golf, by managing the accumulated wealth during his career. The enemies of the court did not however become friends. The hypothesis of a joint interview makes them always think. But they both know, the rivalry has profited them. You know, John has always said that, that Connors made him better because he, 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 he played every point like it was his last point. John often talks about that when he, when he talks about Novak Djokovic, you know, having Nadal and Feder in front of him for years. And, and Jimmy had that personality that was the most similar to John's. A little bit different, a little bit cruder. When you're a kid coming up and you're a top junior and you make your way to the Wimbledon semifinal, you, you basically do that on talent. And you're just better than everyone. But there's no doubt that uh, Connors and his level of intensity that he brought to the court made John a better competitor on the court and made him realize, okay, this is what I have to do. America has never found this originality in a tennis rivalry. 20 years later, Mac and Jimbo have no heirs. The legacy, however, is invaluable and leaves a lot of nostalgic people. Now tennis is a little bit sanitized. 
A lot of people tell me I miss Nastase, McEnroe, Connors. And a lot of people said to themselves, will any of these bad boys somehow shake the umpire's chair and bring it down? Surely now it's no longer likely to happen.